you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to Subiu. I've been here a few times, and it's an honor to be a part of TED. I'm a filmmaker, and I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my experiences and experiments in the world of film, and how they've led me to an appreciation for the importance of constraints and limitations. Constraints and limitations are important for stimulating the kind of creativity that's needed to make really good films. And why I think this is interesting is because story, this thing that we're hardwired from birth to understand and process, this thing that's at the core of all great films, is somehow an endangered species now. And it's a little bit curious because today we live in a time with cheap HD cameras, with accessible software with audiences that we can reach all around the world. And this has led to a whole flood of new filmmakers. And you think maybe that would lead to an intended rise in the number of great films, but it hasn't. So how do we address this problem? Well, uh, let me tell a story. My story begins in Njoro, Kenya. In Njoro, Kenya, where I spent the first three years of my life happily exploring the area where my father was stationed with uh, the Canadian government aid agency. I say happily because my father documented that period on a Super 8 film camera. And screenings of those short 30 second to two and a half minute films became a regular function of family get-togethers in Canada where I grew up. And I come from a big family, so there were a lot of screenings. But the thing that struck me was how these films absolutely mesmerized me. And these short, silent, magical stories on the big screen, I couldn't get enough of them. Now, two years ago, uh, my father had these films digitized and sent them to me. And I was struck how 30 years later, they still affect me in the same way they did at the beginning. And so I got to thinking. And I looked at these films, and my father turns out to have been a pretty good cameraman. Uh, he also understood story. But the thing that I thought was most interesting was that my father was operating under a lot of uh, constraints and obstacles that, uh, that were kind of what happened to filmmakers at the time. For example, the film reels that he used were only a maximum of two and a half minutes long. The film stock was expensive and hard to find. And the processing was also expensive and took a lot of time. The films were silent, something we don't maybe appreciate today that you have to take into consideration, and there were no editing tools. He also had a very targeted audience, namely his family back in Canada. But when these things all got put together, I realized that this is where the magic came from. And it came close to achieving what the great Japanese director Akira Kurosawa calls cinematic beauty. And he defines this as the ability to make an audience experience a particularly deep emotion. Think about your favorite film, and you know what I'm talking about. Now films do a lot of great things, but it's the emotion ultimately that we're after, and that comes from story. I made my first film at the age of nine. Uh, it was shot on my father's camera. My brothers and cousins were involved. It involved a boat chase and a robbery. Um, but the point was, I remember that so clearly, and it, uh, it was such a thrill. But later in life, I couldn't really explain this pull to film that I had uh, until I came across this quote. Walter Murch is probably the greatest living film editor. He's responsible for the Godfather films, Apocalypse Now. And this quote really made me, uh, kind of made things make sense for me. And I got to meet Walter Murch actually here in Romania. I didn't do much with cameras for the next 20 years. <laughs> I went to university and then I traveled. Uh, I traveled a lot. I went back to Africa, the house I was born in. And I spent 18 months in East and South Africa. I then went to Asia, where I traveled extensively, and ended up spending three years in Kyoto, Japan. But it was in Cambodia where I got a camera again. And in this case, a good friend, John Riley, had called me from Phnom Penh saying he found a film production company, was I interested in coming and helping out. I was there in one week. 
And the next morning after arriving, uh, I found myself on the back of a motorcycle being yelled instructions, this is the exact morning, by this guy, the Austrian head of the film company, and he was explaining to me how to use a VHS camera. And our mandate, John and I, was to just shoot as much as we could, to create kind of stock footage at that time. So it, was, it made it very interesting to be able to see this war-ravaged country through a lens like that, but also using this camera, which was tape, which you could just keep filming and put more tapes in or rewind. At the end of this, by the way, we vowed we would make a feature film one day. I ended up in Canada after, and uh, basically I bought my first camera, and this was a digital high eight. It was another level of quality, and it outputted video at broadcast quality standards. I jumped at my first opportunity to go to the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah, where my friend had a film competition. And uh, I sort of picked up where I left off in Cambodia, shooting, shooting, shooting. For four days, I shot everything. And when I came back to Toronto, I uh, was very excited. I called up the national television, the CBC, and said, oh, I've got a great documentary. And they said, great, bring it over. I went over, and their faces dropped because I produced 14 hours of footage. Like 14 hours of footage, and they got less excited when I couldn't really describe the story. I said, well, it was a bunch of different stories. I shot this and I shot that. Luckily, there was a very brilliant and patient editor who got the material, and uh, about three days later, I got a phone call saying, I got your story, which was great. So I've been saved, thankfully. The message was, story is so important. If you're not focused on story, you're not shooting stuff that's going to actually create emotions for people, necessarily. So, I put all that knowledge quickly to use, and I ended up making some slightly more professional documentaries. Then, I was interrupted by a job offer from Romania. Uh, there was a position for marketing director at Connex, you probably all know, uh, a mobile phone company. And I took it, and honestly, I thought I was going to come for six months, see another country, make some money, and go back home and continue making documentaries. Well, the fact that I'm standing here today speaking to you is that, uh, well, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, in truth, I fell in love with this country. Uh, people, the Latin spirit, the culture, and the stories. So many stories, and people just willing and excited to tell stories. And it's no surprise that your film industry, I think, is so strong because of that. Um, anyway, six months turned into three years. Uh, then it took another year in the Czech Republic. And then finally I said, okay, enough's enough. I, I've got to do this film thing. The calling is, is too strong. So I called up John Riley, who is in London now. Said, come on, I'm going to Bucharest. Uh, we're going to make a feature film. Uh, we came, we set up a film company. We then uh, joined forces with an Irish entrepreneur named Barry Mulligan, and the three of us made a pact, kind of a blood pact, and we said, okay. Now, this was all about constraints, right? And we said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make this film in six months, come hell or high water. It's going to be professional. Everything has to be absolutely professional, 90 minutes long, etc. If we have no money, we're still going to make it. We're going to shoot it on a small digital camera. And most importantly, probably, the story had to be exceptional. So we spent weeks and weeks cycling through all the stories we knew. We finally hit on one that we thought uh, would work. It was sort of a slightly unknown story about an uh, immigration scam between Romania and uh, Ireland. Now, people in the film industry will tell you, if you have a good story, a really good story, it'll find its way through. And that kind of proved itself with this. Uh, we grabbed, you know, people gathered around the film. We actually were able to raise real money to do it properly. And uh, six months later, we had a film. It went to more than 20 international film festivals. It won one. It, uh, it was runner-up in another. It got great reviews. But it didn't sell. It didn't get distribution. And that was a tough lesson um, because this film really, we felt, and others felt, it deserved an audience. It was against this backdrop that the idea of a one-minute film came to me from a Brazilian friend who had come across someone who was intrigued. Now, to be honest, when I looked at the one-minute films he was talking about, I wasn't that impressed. There wasn't the story of things that my father had had in his films. But I was absolutely taken by the idea and kept pulling at me, and so I started researching. This was the year that YouTube launched, so there was a lot of talk and chat about web video. 
So there's a lot of information. The more I got into it, the more excited I got. And I eventually contacted a good friend and kind of a big ideas guy, Sabal Kwan. And I said, Sabal, what do you think of this? And he gave me his advice, but he also said, I want, I want to be involved. So I kind of started to think, well, we've got something going on here. But the big question was, could truly great stories be developed in one minute? Could a filmmaker operating on a small budget make a film that would actually have emotional impact? Well, this was the big question, and we said, you know what, we got to try. So, the thing that we said again, constraints. We needed to have some constraints, because what we needed to create, the challenge, was to create an environment where the best possible, would stimulate the creativity to create the best possible films. It had to have a great story. There was, there was no question that that was going to be the first thing. The second thing was 60 seconds. We would make it exactly 60 seconds. No more, no less. And we said, you know, how are we going to get the great, great people to make these films? Well, we need a really, really good jury. We also need to be global, because this is what it's all about. It needed to have a competition, and it needed to have a great website. So this is what we created. And five years later, uh, I can say that we've had quite a bit of success with it, in the sense that we've proven some of those theories. You can make an amazing film in one minute. We've got a, we only take 25 films each year, and so it limits. But those 125 films are, in my mind, all very special. Uh, we've had film submissions from over 70 countries. We've had audiences from more than 150. And we've had very relevant and inspiring juries. A great deal has changed since my father made those films uh, in, this, you know, in the 60s. Uh, obstacles that filmmakers from that time had no choice but to accept and work around have been removed. And so we now live in a time where actually the focus is on the most important constraint of all, which is story. And so what I think is interesting is that the more we work on creating opportunities, like Film Minute, to take advantage of the many new viewing platforms, but also take care to impose the right mix of constraints and limitations, the more we're going to have great stories that will eventually lead to great films, feature films, shorts, etc. What's the message?